Steve has lived in Venezuela for decades. He teaches at the university there, and maybe he'll tell you a little bit at some point about the two universities he teaches at, the formal and the less formal, because I think that's very interesting and also informative about um, one aspect of the revolution that's going on in Venezuela. It's kind of ironic that just uh, a little over a month or two months after elections were held in December of 2013, when the Chavistas won their, their candidates, if they were municipal elections, and those candidates won by an 11.5 percentage margin with regard to the candidates of the opposition, when people thought, both people in the opposition and neutral and uh, independence and the Chavez people felt that, wow, for the first time in a long while, perhaps 15 years, we're going to have a certain amount of social and political stability for the next two years. Because uh, in the Venezuela of Hugo Chavez, elections were held constantly. There were elections, there were recall elections, there were referendums, um, uh, internal elections. And it seemed that hardly a year went by without an electoral uh, uh, contest of one sort or another. And that naturally created a certain amount of tension. So that in, when uh, Chavez died uh, in March of 2013, presidential elections were held uh, the following, were held in April, the following month. And the uh, provisional president, uh, Nicolas Maduro was elected, but elected by a surprisingly small margin of the vote. There was just a 1.5% difference between uh, Maduro and Enrique Capriles, the candidate of the United Opposition. And immediately the opposition announced that it would not recognize those electoral results. I won't go into the details with regard to their accusation of electoral fraud. Um, I won't go into the details with regard to the electoral system and how that accusation um, didn't have any basis at all. Uh, in fact, the only, practically the only country in the world that thought that it did was the United States. All, all, the, all the countries of the world, I think Canada was also an exception, but all the countries of Latin America and almost all the countries of the world uh, accepted the results of those elections. But it is true that 1.5% is a small margin. Chavez won by much wider margins. Uh, he won the president, presidential elections of uh, 2006 uh, with 63% of the vote, which was the highest percentage of vote of any presidential candidate in modern Venezuelan history since 1958. Um, so that the fact that Maduro won by only 1.5% uh, raised red flags. People thought that the situation perhaps had changed, that Maduro certainly didn't have the charisma that Chavez had. But in December, municipal elections were held and the Chavez candidates uh, not only won, but those elections, Capriles, whose name I just mentioned, who uh, was the leading figure of the opposition, announced prior to those elections that the, pre the municipal elections of December are going to be a plebiscite. In other words, if the opposition wins those elections, then that means that the Chavistas have lost their legitimacy. And it's really, it was really unfair because in US elections and elections throughout the world, in democratic countries throughout the world, uh, the uh, candidate, the, the party that's in power very often loses, uh, as happens usually in midterm elections here in the States. They lose uh, congressional elections or municipal elections, and that doesn't really mean anything in terms of the legitimacy of the government. But in any case, that statement backfired for the opposition because the Chavis has won with an 11.5% margin. So that it was felt that, you know, uh, there were no further elections uh, to be held in 2014, and 2015, uh, the 
congressional elections are slated for December. So that nearly, well, two years exactly of uh, uh, electoral stability, political stability, especially because the Chavis is won by such a, a wide margin. But that wasn't the case. And I'm sure all of you have heard about the disruptions, the violence, uh, and the word that I use is terrorism, that have taken place since February. Now, uh, Henry mentioned uh, incidences that have taken place throughout the world where the United States does not recognize legitimate governments um, uh, and support the opposition. The opposition engages in protests. Um, and I'd like to just make reference to that because something similar is happening in, in Venezuela and it really leads one to believe that there is a manual, call it a CIA manual or State Department manual or what have you, because the coincidence is just too glaring. And that is that in the countries that Henry mentioned, in, in, in Libya, which you didn't mention, but Libya, Syria, the Ukraine, which you did mention, in each one of those countries, um, peaceful protests quickly turn into violent ones. And it's that combination of the peaceful and violent protests that, it, in my mind, is really the secret of the strategy of those people who are trying to overthrow the government. And, you know, uh, I, I'm coming from a, a conference of my, um, the Latin American Studies Association, I'm a Latin American specialist, and I go to my, my, uh, uh, my organization, is called LASA. Uh, it held its uh, meeting in its annual Congress in Chicago, and somebody <coughs> told me that in Chile also, the same scenario of a combination of peaceful and violent protests were designed to create a situation in which the opposition could say, the government is undemocratic, it's violating human rights, and that is, th th this person told me, who became politically conscious um, uh, in the early 70s in Chile, and she said that uh, upper class women uh, would bang on pots and pans. But the rightist group, Patria y Libertad, Fatherland and, and uh, Liberty, if you want to translate it that way, um, would be in the shadows of these women, uh, creating disruptions. So that when the police came in, or the military came in to preserve the order, the opposition, relying on the media that was heavily anti-Allende, uh, anti-government, would say, look at, uh, you know, these are communists, uh, they don't believe in democracy, they don't believe in human rights, and look what they're doing. And in addition to that, they're beating up on our women. That, 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 would, that was their message. Um, and it's, it, it's something similar to that uh, has happened in these other countries. And in the case of Venezuela, um, it, it, it's happening in a big way. Because the protests, the peaceful protests, um, have uh, been, uh, have received a lot of attention, a lot of publicity. And the media uh, conflates the peaceful demonstrations and the violent ones, leaving the impression that when the military comes in and uh, uh, tries to maintain order uh, in the situation of violence and destruction on the part of the, the violent protesters, that they're really doing that against the peaceful protests. But there's an added element. And that is that the military, the security forces, can't just uh, stay removed from, this, from, from the peaceful protests. Because the peaceful protests are disruptive. They're not. They're peaceful protests. And that's what the opposition, and that's what the media harps on, the peaceful protests. But none of those protests, and there have been thousands of them in these last three months, but none of them, or maybe one or two, but I'll tell you, very few, if any, uh, have really been legal because they've all been disruptive. And what they do, typically, is they will protest on a main drag 
uh, for instance, where I live, I live in a twin city area. So the main avenue connecting one city and the other, um, they will take over two out of three lanes on both sides. And so block the traffic. And the cars that go by the lane that's open go by slowly. They, 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 they spray paint slogans on the window. So that in a matter of you know, five or 10 minutes, the traffic backs up from us. So that the opposition uses the term peaceful protest. And they are peaceful, but they're not legal. Okay? Now, um, you may ask, as I get asked, what proof do I have that the violence is being carried out by the opposition and not by the government? Because one of the, the tactics of the opposition is to say, these are Chavistas, uh, in Spanish they call them infiltrators, uh, provocateurs, who are creating the violence. And it seems to me that it's, it's obvious that that is not the case for a number of reasons. And I'd like to just mention that because the media in the States picks, picks up on this. The media conveys the same impression that the violence is being carried out by the Chavistas, um, that the police are responsible, that the National Guards, Guard is responsible, and that there are social movements, and in Spanish, and now they're calling them collectives, that's a term that the opposition has come up with now, that these collectives, and they're conjuring up this image of uh, the riffraff, quote unquote, uh, that are coming in there from the barrios, and there's an element of racism, and also uh, what they call in Spanish classism, uh, uh, class prejudice. Um, and it's not the first time that this has happened. Uh, at the time of the coup in 2002, it was the same thing. They talked about the Chavista groups that were then called the Bolivarian circles. And they were supposedly riding around in tanks, uh, which was a complete lie, and everybody realized that it was a complete lie, but that created the atmosphere that justified the coup against Chavez. And something similar to that is happening today. Now, you may ask, how do I know? Firstly, the violence is taking place completely, 99%, 98%, okay? In order not to exaggerate. The violence is taking place in those cities in those municipalities controlled by the opposition. In the Chavista cities, in the Chavista areas, nothing is taking place. At least there's no violence. And the protests are very, very minimal. Um, so you may ask, if it's the Chavistas who are carrying out, who are responsible for the violence, why don't these mayors do anything about it? And the fact of the matter is that they don't. If it were Chavistas that were doing this, the mayor would, would go to the spot, call a press conference, and there, at least the written media is completely pro-opposition, and they would, they would denounce these actions. But the fact of the matter is they don't. Point number two. The targets of the violence have been state property. In Caracas, there have been 80 metro buses that have been damaged, heavily damaged. Um, metro stations, again, in the city, in Caracas is divided into different municipalities. There are four municipalities controlled by the opposition. That's where the violence is taking place. The big municipality, which is downtown Caracas, and the, in the, in the western part of Caracas, which is where the, the lower income people live, that has been exempt from protests and violence. Um, the targets have been the, met the metro stations in the eastern part of Caracas where the opposition is in control and where the middle class is concentrated. Um, there's just one uh, metro station, it's called Parque Carabobo, which is in the Chavista area that has been subject to destruction also. But that's the exception that proves the rule. Furthermore, this same combination of peaceful and violent protests 
was exactly what occurred the day of the coup against Chavez in 2002. On April 11th, 2002, there was a peaceful, massive demonstration against Chavez that at the last moment, they decided to march downtown. And at the same time, there was what they call a vanguard of opposition people who were creating havoc in downtown Caracas. They were shooting and um, all the TV channels uh, broadcasted, uh, showed images of Chavez people in a concentration of a, of a, of a group of Chavistas uh, uh, on an overpass in downtown uh, Caracas shooting at peaceful demonstrators. So the media, the TV channels would show the march of the opposition, and it was a massive march. They had, you know, easily 100,000 people. The march of the opposition and these dirty, bad guy Chavistas shooting at them. And so you saw one image and the other. One image and the other. And that was not only played out in Caracas, in Venezuela, but throughout the world throughout the world, uh, um, you saw these, this juxtaposition of images of a peaceful demonstration and Chavez people who were shooting at them, apparently at them. That was a justification that uh, Ari Fleischer, of the, um, who was the press secretary of, of, of Bush, used to justify U.S. support for the coup. That there were these 15, 20 people who were killed. Chavez gave the orders to shoot at these people. And now, thank goodness, He's out of the picture. But the fact of the matter is that there was an Irish team, and perhaps many of you have seen the movie, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Um, how many people have seen that uh, documentary? Well, uh, you, uh, that, that, that documentary shows plainly that these guys were shooting. And the avenue, which is the avenue, the avenue of Baralt, below that overpass, was empty. There weren't anybody there. Now the difference between that documentary and what the TV channel showed is that the TV channels showed different images and they put them together. But if there's an image of Henry sitting back there and another image of me and they play it back and forth, you don't know whether Henry is here or in China. These are separate images. But in the case of this Irish team, there's a flow of the camera. And the flow shows that on the streets below, they were getting shot, and that's why they were shooting. But they weren't shooting at demonstrators because the demonstration hadn't reached downtown Caracas yet. So what I'm saying is that what's happening today is a replay of that situation. What was that situation? It was a combination, an articulation between the peaceful protest and the violent protests. And the violent protests are designed to provoke the security forces to create a situation of violence in order to demonstrate that the government is repressing the people. Okay. Um, I just uh, mentioned one more point about why it's obvious that, firstly, this violence is being carried out by the opposition. And secondly, that it's intentional, that it's not something that's spontaneous. And that furthermore, the violent protests and the peaceful protests are working together. And that is something personal, uh, which I th am sure that if you ask anybody who lives in Venezuela, they will confirm what I'm saying. And that is that the opposition claims that the Chavistas uh, are aggressive, that this comes from Chavez's discourse. But the fact of the matter is that the opposition is extremely aggressive. I'm not talking about the protesters now. I'm talking about people who belong to the opposition. And just based on personal experience, I can say without any doubt that the kinds of the kind of frustration, anger um, that characterizes characterizes uh, the right in Europe, that um, 
just uh, scored very well in these elections in, in Europe. Um, and the Tea Party people here, the kind of aggressiveness, uh, expressions of anger, emotion, uh, that you get that in Venezuela in a big way. And specifically, you hear people in the opposition all the time say that the problem with Venezuela is Chavez, now they're saying the problem with Venezuela is Maduro, and, you know, I wish he'd die. I wish somebody would kill him. And that statement, you hear time and time again. They're not isolated statements, because if you hear somebody say something once, that's not representative of anything. But you hear neighbors, you hear people that you know, colleagues. I'm not talking about um, uh, people who you don't know, people who live out in the boondocks. I'm talking about people who are your next door neighbor. And you hear this all the time. I do a lot of interviewing in the, in the barrios. Uh, I think Henry mentioned that I teach, um, I'm a professor at the, one of the major universities in Venezuela, but I'm retired. And now I teach, uh, not this semester, but over the last five or six years, I've been teaching in a kind of like a makeshift uh, university program that Chavez set up. It's called the Sucre Mission. And they're all people from the Barrios. And they're all Chavistas. Most of them are Chavistas. And I engage in conversations with them all the time. And I've never heard anybody, either in the Barrios or the middle class Chavez people that I know, I have not heard one Chavez person say the same about the opposition that the anti-Chavez people say about the Chavista leaders. When Chavista leaders, uh, when several leaders passed away in different circumstances, the governor of the state of Guadico was an important national leader, um, a constitu uh, an important lawyer, a Chavista lawyer. Um, there was a period in which three or four of them, and you'd, you'd hear opposition people say, you know, this is the wrath of God, or this is happening for some reason. So that what I'm trying to say is that for somebody who lives in Venezuela, it's not at all surprising that this kind of violence is taking place because it's an expression of the hatred, of the anger of the middle class. Um, something similar to the Tea Party phenomenon here in the United States. And, and one last thing I want to say with regard to my case for um, uh, the opposition's responsibility for the violence. And that is that from the very outset, the demand of the opposition was not specific reforms, was not specific uh, proposals. From the very outset, the opposition was calling for regime change. And that in Spanish, the term that was used was salida, ya salida is exit, and ya is now. They dropped this, the ya, they dropped the word now. But salida is that. What the opposition is calling for is regime change. Now how, and they are convinced, or they were convinced, that the regime change was gonna take place in a matter of weeks. And they, and they said this time and time again, just hold in, the, you know, um, hang in there. Uh, we're going to overthrow this government in a, in a matter of two weeks. Well, how would the opposition overthrow the government if these protests stayed in the sidewalks? Uh, if the protests were peaceful and not disruptive, there's no way that the opposition would overthrow the government. It would be impossible, especially given the fact that the government just won more than 50% of the vote. And the government has the ability to mobilize people um, so that just the fact that the opposition mobilized, mobilizes people, it does not give them any possibility for overthrowing the government, given the circumstances of a government that was just elected and a government that has a mobilization capacity. So the only way to do it is through violence, and that's exactly what they've been engaged in. Now, this is a, in my mind, a black and white um, issue. Uh, it's evident in my mind who's responsible for the situation. Um, it's evident in my mind that um, the opposition is demonstrating uh, uh, no um, uh, faith in the democratic process or no commitment to democracy. It's black and white. But there are issues that the opposition is exploring. 
which I think um, needs to be discussed because these issues are not black and white. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there are real problems. And um, one, one of the problems is, I think, uh, ideological to a certain extent, or you can look at it through ideology and then look at it through, um, through the way ideology works out in practice. And that is that the, 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 the ex this experience with socialism in Venezuela and the experience with socialism in other Latin American countries such as Bolivia and Ecuador, what's called the 21st century left, in many ways is facing challenges that are more complex than the challenges that leftist socialists face in the 20th century. In the case of the Communist Party, they reached power in the Soviet Union in 1917, um, China in 1949, the case of Cuba in the 1960s, and social democratic parties as well. The kinds of challenges that are being faced uh, are more complex. Uh, and if you compare, for instance, uh, the situation with Venezuela with the situation of Allende in Chile, uh, the situation is quite different also. And being different, uh, there's a degree of complexity that Allende, in certain ways, didn't, didn't face during those brief three years that he was in power. And that is that this is a democratic road to socialism. It's not a social democratic road to socialism. Social, de social democracy, in my mind, social democracy in the 20th century as opposed to the early 20th century when you know, Lenin was a social democrat originally, but social democracy is the term that we, we know it as, and the social democratic parties and the socialist international believe in socialism in the absence of conflict, or at least in the absence of sharp confrontation. That was one of the fundamental differences between Marx and Kant, the positivist of the 19th century. Kant felt that change takes place gradually, and that violence and confrontation and contradictions are not inherent in that process, whereas Marx thought that uh, you can't bring about change without conflict. And it, in the case of these countries, these countries um, uh, are in a situation of intense polarization. And that kind of polarization didn't exist, uh, for instance, in England with the Labour Party after World War II. Um, uh, and that intense polarization is not only political polarization in which the, oppos the opposition uh, is united and has been united since uh, before the elections that brought Chavez to power in 1998, those parties united uh, prior to those elections against Chavez. So you have a, a, a real polarization that is political but also social. And the middle class, uh, to a large extent, is opposed and vehemently opposed uh, to the Chavistas in power. And this democratic road to socialism in an, a situation of intense polarization, open spaces, for the opposition to engage in legal, semi-legal, and illegal activity, which is what we're seeing now. The violence is an example of illegal activity. The so-called peaceful demonstrations, which are disruptive, you may classify as semi-legal. Um, uh, and uh, you can also say, more so in the case of Bolivia and Ecuador than, than, than Venezuela, you can say that this peaceful road to socialism opens up space not only on the right but also on the left and Morales and especially Correa in the case of Ecuador have faced um, very severe criticism from groups to their left. Um, now in the case of Allende you can say that Allende was just in power for three years and faced a situation of, of violence uh, the threat of a military coup, um, and disruptions. So that at no point when he was in power was there really a focus on the need to demonstrate the viability of the socialist model. Because there were uh, pressing challenges coming from the, the, the right, supported by the US government, um, and that was the focus of the leftists in power. But in the case of Venezuela, 
the Chavistas have been in power now for almost 16 years, for 15 and a half years. And not now, but during certain periods, there was a certain degree of stability in the country. And so it was incumbent on Chavez to demonstrate that this thing can work, that his model of socialism can function, is viable, and to demonstrate a degree of efficiency. And the problem there is that unlike the cases of the communists in power in the Soviet Union and China and Cuba, and to a certain extent the Social Democrats as well, um, which were parties that were working class parties, they defined themselves as working class parties. So from an ideological viewpoint, things were simpler uh, because there was that common denominator. Of course, there were different currents within the communist movement, within the government, um, uh, but there was that common denominator, uh, a proletariat party, and that was the um, strategy. It was a working class strategy. In the case of Venezuela, and the case of these other countries that I've mentioned, there is considerable emphasis on the multi-class nature of these movements, and specifically the marginalized sectors of the population. When I say marginalized, I'm referring to that big chunk of the population, the working population, that belongs to the informal economy. That is, those people who don't have steady work, they work for themselves, they're street peddlers, um, uh, that kind of thing. And also, I would define in this category of uh, non-proletarian, um, those workers who work for very small companies in the formal economy, but they're so small that there's no union leadership. In some cases, they're not protected by union or worker legislation, labor legislation. So that that is a big chunk of the population between the informal economy workers, the workers who work for very, very small firms, and the rural workforce. You're talking about, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent of the population. I don't have the statistics, but that's a big chunk of the population. And the, these movements in the three countries that I mentioned have emphasized uh, the importance, the commitment of the government to these people. Um, Chavez, for instance, stated, uh, and it really irked the middle class a lot, when he stated, I am the president of all Venezuelans, and I'm committed to working for you know, all the people, uh, even the middle class, the companies, the business people, that's my job. But my priority is the marginalized sectors of the population because they need me more. Um, and that also um, relates to liberation theology, which in the 60s and 70s, or 70s and 80s rather, became a big thing um, in Latin America, late 60s and up until the 80s. Um, uh, the liberation theology in Latin America uh, uh, claimed that biblical teaching uh, uh, singles out marginalized people for special treatment. They, they're considered special according to the Bible. And that has had an influence on the 21st century left in these countries. So that that complicates things because I argue that you can divide the Chavista movement in these three blocks. The working class, the organized working class with union representation, the middle class, which even though as a whole is opposed to Chavez, nevertheless, the uh, a significant, significant number of Chavista leaders at all levels, the local level, the activists, a lot of them come from the middle class. Uh, and the marginalized block of the population that I just mentioned. And I would argue that these three groups have different visions and they have different interests. And that furthermore, those interests at times enter into conflict. Uh, and that's really what Marx and Marxism teaches, is that a class analysis will say, will demonstrate that uh, you know, a worker isn't going to have the same interests and is not going to have the same vision, not going to have the same ideology as somebody in the middle class probably, because their uh, circumstances are different and their uh, goals are different and their challenges are different. So that um, this has created a certain amount of tension. For instance, just to give you uh, one or perhaps two examples, um, the community councils, 
that is an important part of the Chavista um, program uh, of encouraging people in communities, uh, communities between 200 and 400 families, to establish community councils that apply for funding and get funding. They choose priority projects. They get the money, in some cases, directly. Uh, and in other cases, the projects are carried out by construction companies. But these community councils monitor the work of the construction companies. And they hire, or they have a big input, in the hiring of the workers for those companies. So that th th this really represents something new for Venezuela. Community councils existed in the past, going back at least to the early 80s. The government that was in power between 79 and 80, 84 um, promoted community councils, but community councils that really didn't have any official power. In this case, uh, the community council law that was passed in 2006 um, allows these community councils to apply for funding, they receive funding. It, the community councils are really uh, a branch of the state in a certain sense. They, they have official authority uh, in the sense that um, they get money, money directly and they carry out these public works projects. Now this has been a very important experience for people and I argue that I would argue that the community councils are more important for the marginalized sectors of the population than for the working class. For the simple reason that workers have had previous organizational experiences. They've had experiences with unions. They've had experience um, with uh, 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 collective action when workers go on strike. There's a sense of discipline in order to uh, go on strike, you have to have discipline, you have to have organizational skills. Whereas the marginalized sectors of the population, these community councils are novel experiences for them. Um, and so I would argue that this is really fundamental and it explains to a great extent why the marginalized sectors of the population, firstly, have gained a sense of empowerment uh, under Chavez, and secondly, why they represent the backbone of the, uh, of the Chavista movement. One of the things that the government encourages the community councils to do is to, in some cases, is to take the money themselves and to carry out their projects on their own. Because the alternative is for this money to be assigned to construction companies. But the argument is that the construction companies are easily blackmailed or pressured by criminal elements, pseudo construction worker unions, or unions that have been taken over by organized crime. And they uh, force the construction company to hire their people, and their people don't do anything. It's basically, you know, um, uh, just blackmail. Uh, and in some cases, they create disruption. Uh, they show up with, you know, heavily armed, and that kind of thing. So that the argument is that if the community councils carry out these projects themselves, they will bypass the unions. But you speak to the union leaders, which I've done, and they all tell you that, that that's not the way to go. That work involves um, uh, conflict, work involves um, uh, uh, problems on the, on the job, and that the unions are the organizations that are designed to resolve those conflicts. And that the idea isn't to sidestep side the unions, but to be sure that the unions that do get to represent the workers are honest and reliable unions. So there's a difference in the criteria here. And the union leaders will say, there is an anti-union uh, sentiment that manifests itself in this form within the Chavista movement. And the Chavistas, uh, some of the Chavistas in the marginalized sectors of the, of, of the cities will say the unions are unreliable, the unions are responsible for the problems that we've had, um, and we can do without them. So this is just one example of how this multi-class uh, focus of the Chavista movement uh, uh, creates problems, creates difficulties, and creates tensions. Now, in addition to these three different 
social blocks that I mentioned. There's a fourth block, which it's essential to understand their role in the Chavista phenomenon in order to understand the types of problems that Venezuela is facing today. And it goes back to the coup in 2002 that I mentioned before. In April 2002, uh, there was a movement to overthrow Chavez that succeeded for two days. And the president for those two days was the president of the National Chamber of Commerce in Venezuela, it's called Fede Comas. So the president of Fede Comas became the president of Venezuela for two days. After Chavez returned, he was forced out, he fled the country, but just seven or eight months later, there was a two-month general strike. It was really a lockout, it wasn't a general strike. It was a company lockout. And it was led by the successor of that head of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Carlos Fernandez. So the head of the Chamber of Commerce led two attempts to overthrow the government. Now during that general strike, that general strike was defeated as a result of the mobilization capacity of the Chavista government. And uh, there were uh, people in the community who provided services. The workers, the, 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 the white, the blue collar workers, as a rule, did not support the general strike. The white collar workers did. So that there was a, a um, participation on the part of the people who had a certain loyalty to the Chavisa government, and thanks to them, this strike effort was defeated. But in addition to that uh, um, mobilization of people in favor of the government uh, and against the general strike, there was another element that, had, that was important to a certain extent, and that was there was a group of business people <coughs> who um, uh, decided not to support the general strike. And those business people who carried out important activities, especially in the area of transportation, uh, consisted of three types of business people, or three types of motivation. One is some of those business people were pro-Chavez. Um, and were opposed to the uh, general strike for political reasons. They supported the government. Others felt that it was um, professionally unethical for business people to go on strike. They were opposed to the government. They felt that uh, it was not the role of business people to get engaged in, in political activity. And so they decided to work. And there were some opportunists who made a, a lot of money um, providing essential services during the, the, the two-month general strike. When the strike was over, the Chavez government had two options. One is they could have said, once they define themselves as socialists, because the strike was in 2002-2003, Chavez de declared himself socialist in January of 2005. So at that point, the Chavistas could have said, we're socialists, we have nothing to offer or nothing to, nothing in common with business people because socialism and business are antithetical. Uh, we recognize that Venezuela has a capitalist economy and so we will tolerate business but we won't have anything to do with them directly. But there was another option, which was a more intelligent option in my mind. And that is, given the fact that the main business organization and other business organizations as well, uh, supported and was actively involved in the overthrow of the government in April and the attempted overthrow of the government in December, January of the following year, uh, December of 2002, January 2003, that it made sense to provide or develop a special relationship with those business people who had uh, opposed the general strike. Regardless of their motivations, even in the case of the opportunists, the feeling was, I believe, on the part of the Chavista government, that even the opportunists had proven themselves to be more reliable than the Fede Communist people. And so the decision was made to develop a special relationship with those people. Chavez announced <coughs> um, 
uh, shortly after the general strike that he would not supply one preferential dollar to the coup business people. Now that probably isn't easy for you to digest because nobody knows what preferential dollars are. But in Venezuela, it's a way of life. And it goes back before Chavez, it goes back to 1983. But preferential dollars is a system in which uh, importers uh, are sold dollars at a much lower rate in order to import products. Um, if somebody wants to buy dollars on the open market rate, on the open market, they have to pay a lot more. And currently, the difference is something like eight to one. So that if you apply for dollars, if you demonstrate that you're gonna import something, um, the government will sell you these dollars at a much lower exchange rate. But Chavez announced that the government would not sell preferential dollars to these coup people, the business people who participated in the coup against the government. And over the years, there was an emerging bourgeoisie. And the government really felt that this was an ally, um, uh, that the established business class could not be trusted. They were, they, were, they were adamantly opposed to the government. They had demonstrated that twice in 2002, 2003, but they actually demonstrated that from the very beginning when Chavez first ran as president. And so that business organization had to be displaced. And the government, the government strategy had to be to rely on these business people uh, who are outside of the uh, influence, area of influence of the Chamber of Commerce. Now this was not a stated policy. This was not a, uh, an official strategy on the part of the government. But this is exactly what the government did. The problem is that although it may have made sense in 2003, that policy of favoring some business people and not others was conducive to inefficiency and worse yet, corruption. And in 2009, 2009-2010, there was a banking crisis involving a lot of startup banks. Uh, I, I, I think there were nine, or I think there were nine, nine banks which went under, which were taken over by the government. Uh, Fourteen bankers who were jailed, and 40 arrest orders for other bankers who fled the country. Now, many of these bankers were closely associated with the Chavez government. One of them was the brother of Jesse Chacon. Uh, Arne Chacon is his name. He was the uh, president of one of these banks, or several banks, was involved in several banks. And he um, had been a Chavista. Both him and his brother, who was a minister, uh, was, were involved in the coup in 1992. The, the coup that Chavez staged uh, in 1992, and actually there were two of them, and they were involved in the second coup. They went to jail, uh, having participated in that coup. So these, these were leftists. <coughs> but um, the brother, and, and I don't believe that the minister should be blamed, because, I mean, really, if there's no proof that he was responsible, I, you know, innocent until proven guilty, but he did resign. Um, and, and the brother, went, the, the, the banker, went to jail and was in jail for three years, along with other bankers. They were in jail for three years. Um, and more recently, uh, a second crisis uh, has occurred. Uh, the result of this close nexus between the government and the private sector. And that is that these pre 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 preferential dollars that I mentioned before um, were going to bogus companies. And in early 2013, um, the planning minister, who is a, a, a leading figure, a well-known figure in the Chavisa government, and then the president of the central bank, and then Maduro himself, the president, announced that $20 billion were, were sold to these bogus companies for supposed imports. In other words, companies would set up 
these business people who set up companies with false names or would register companies uh, and get the dollars and not do anything with them. Or what they do would be to they'd receive dollars, they'd pay for the dollars, and then they'd sell the dollars at a much higher rate. Because at that time, the ratio was two to one. Not, now it's much higher. But at the time it was two to one. This was in 2012. It was announced in 2013, but the reference was to transactions that took place in 2012. So in 2012, the official rate was 4.3 bolivares, that's a local currency, to the dollar. But the open market rate was more like nine. So that these corrupt business people, and certainly with corrupt government officials, they were making a killing. They would uh, receive the money at 4.30, exchange rate, 4.30 to the dollar, and then sell them at nine. And so if there were $20 billion that uh, were sold under those circumstances, the government basically lost half of that. In other words, the business people paid for the dollars, but paid at a much lower rate. So that um, they were paying $10 billion for $20 billion worth. Now, um, I say this because I want to drive home the point, which is the point that I make in this book. Uh, not, not, I, I don't make it myself. I'm the editor of the book. Uh, there are chapters on Ecuador, Cuba, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Bolivia, Venezuela. I write the chapter on Venezuela. Um, and several other chapters on theory. And they all reach the same conclusion, that the situation is very complex. And it's complex because, in my mind, and I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap up with this um, statement, that I don't believe it's that easy as to say, well, let's just clamp down on the corruption, throw these guys in a clink. I mean, they should do that. I'm not saying they shouldn't. But it's not that easy because the, the Government is not relying on a movement of people who I would say have a high level of consciousness. I don't believe they have a high level of consciousness and I don't believe that they have a low level of consciousness. I think that there are certain demonstrations that the popular sectors of the population, which form the backbone of the Chavista movement, um, have acted and demonstrate, demonstrated an incredible awareness of what's happening in the country. They did that at the time of the coup, when they came down from the hills the, where the poor people live. They surrounded the, the military barracks. They surrounded the presidential palace. And thanks to the movement of the poor people, not the middle class Chavistas, the poor people, um, they did not accept that Chavez had resigned. They, were not hoodwinked. The middle class was. When the TV personalities, and one in particular, stood up with a piece of paper in his hand and said, this is the resignation of Chavez. Chavez has resigned. And middle class people believe that. The New York Times, I was just looking at a, at a clipping that I had from the New York Times. The New York Times editorial believed that. The New York Times editorial, there was no proof that Chavez had resigned, other than the fact that this guy stood up but without focusing on the writing. Um, and the poor people came down from the hills, and at first, they weren't calling for Chavez's um, uh, return to power. They were insisting on proof. They wanted to know where Chavez was and whether or not he had resigned. So that, you know, the poor people have demonstrated. Today, with the violence that's taking place, I find it really, Amazing that the middle class people, professionals that I know, who belong to the opposition, uh, believe anything that the equivalent of Fox News tell, tells them. I mean, I find it really amazing that intelligent people believe that it's the Chavistas that are killing policemen, it's the Chavistas that are killing six National Guardsmen. Six National Guardsmen have been killed. And people in the opposition believe that the Chavistas themselves are responsible. They just killed one of the leading Chavista figures. 
uh, Otaisa, Eliasar Otaisa, who goes back to the 92 coup also, and was a, a person very close to Chavez. And they just killed him, he was assassinated. And people in the opposition believe that, uh, well, a bunch of uh, hoodlums did it in order to rob him. Uh, but the poor people don't. So that, in that sense, there is a high level of consciousness on the part of the people who supported Chavez. But at the same time, consider the following. The labor movement, the Chavista labor movement, is divided in two. They haven't been able to get their act together. There's a more radical Chavista labor movement and another confederation, the two confederations. The other confederation is more party-oriented. Um, they believe that their duty is to provide political support for the government. And so uh, there, there's considerable conflict between those two factions of organized labor. When the workers um, raise the banner of worker control, which has been an important banner going back to, well, go, going back uh, uh, actually to, and as a first step, he allowed the workers to choose the presidents of those companies. So that the steel company, the only steel company in the country, which Chavez nationalized, the aluminum companies, the uh, big industrial companies of Venezuela, the presidents were chosen by the workers. They were called worker presidents. And many of them were workers themselves. And others, such as the steel company, the president was not a worker, but he was chosen by the workers. Um, nevertheless, that failed in, to, to the extent that there was infighting among the workers. Um, the demand for worker control was conflated with the uh, economic demands. In a lot of cases, workers would be calling for the right to make decisions, but really what they wanted was higher wages or uh, uh, economic, better economic um, benefits. So that, that's another example of how an evaluation of the subjective conditions in Venezuela demonstrates that uh, <coughs> you do not have, perhaps, the conditions to just move along steadily in the direction of socialism. And that explains, in my mind, why it was necessary, at least at the outset, for the Chavez government to rely on certain people who are not 100% reliable, business people and uh, some opportunists. Um, who were able to mobilize people, but really <clears throat> were not that reliable in terms of their political commitment. So that, I say this because <coughs> um, it, it, it demonstrates that this task has not been simple and that it's an ongoing struggle. Marxists have debated just what socialism is. Um, and some Marxists uh, claim that Marx didn't envision socialism as a static kind of change, but rather a system which was inherently based on contradictions, inherently based on conflict, and that it was a transition from capitalism to communism. But if you're going to expect that with socialism you're going to have social stability, economic stability, political stability, it goes against the grain of the very system. And that's basically what I think is happening today in Venezuela. It is not surprising that you have the kinds of conflicts that are taking place today in the context of economic scarcities, in the context of inflation, the highest inflation in Latin America, which is now 65%. Although these problems existed before, in the 1990s, inflation in 1996 reached 102%. So when the opposition says, you know, look what the Chavistas have done, this is a mess, well, that has to be placed in context, in historical context also. Because throughout the 1990s, inflation was very high. Uh, not only 102% in 96, but in other years it was 70%. It was way up there. So that the situation in the last couple of years um, have become, has become very, very difficult. And that leads into the political conflict that we see today. Um, but that really is to be expected. <coughs>
But I think that, and I'm going to end on this note, that there are solutions. It's a trial and error path to socialism, but eventually solutions will be found and solutions are being found. And I think that that, is, that explains precisely why it is that the opposition decided to engage in violence at this moment. Because a lot of people think or are surprised that just when the Chavistas won these elections and just when for the first time perhaps since Chavez came to office, there was the prospect of two years free of elections and free of intense political conflict. Just in that moment, the protest broke out and suddenly led into um, to, 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 to violence. And I think that part of the explanation for that is that the opposition doesn't want the Chavistas to have a respite in order to develop viable programs. Uh, they're afraid of that, um, uh, which is exactly what happened in the case of Chile. Nixon's famous statement, let the economy scream. You'd think that if the economy was screaming, in a democratic context, that the opposition doesn't have anything to worry about. They're going to win the next elections. And if the opposition is so sure that the economy um, doesn't have any um, resolution to the, to, to the problems that the economy faces, then the opposition should just lay back and wait for two years and they'll be back in power. But that's not the case. I think that this, what's happening today, demonstrates that the opposition in the United States, which is supporting the opposition, that they are very much afraid of giving socialism a chance, but not only giving socialism a chance, but giving democracy a chance as well. Thank you.